I think the last time the Detroit Pistons had a good basketball team was, was in 2008. Two, 2008. Now, they have made the playoffs a few times since then, but like one of the times they made it as a sub-500 team was the 8th seed, got swept by LeBron James. Another time they made it um, slightly above 500, and that core was kind of interesting. It was like Drummond. It was a young Tobias Harris, a young Stanley Johnson. I actually enjoyed watching that team. They snuck in as an 8th seed, and guess what? They got swept by LeBron James. And the last time they made the playoffs was when Blake Griffin single-handedly Bro, Detroit basketball back. That is, without a doubt, one of my favorite individual seasons of all time. But guess what they did? They were a 500 team, snuck into the playoffs, and got swept. Like, it's been a it's been a minute. And since the Blake Griffin year, I think we're going into year number six since Blake Griffin was doing that. And I can't tell you exactly what the expectations for this team is six years removed from the last year they made the playoffs. And that is some... Some scary, scary stuff. Like some teams, the expectation is to win the championship. It is championship of us. Other teams' expectation or, or successful season is being as bad as possible and winning Cooper flag. Other teams are just happy with making the playoffs. The Detroit Pistons have been bad for so very long. I have no idea what would be considered a successful season for them and their fans. Like this is hard to really say because they practically had a lost year last year. The 2023-2024 season shouldn't even exist. You shouldn't even be able to see it on their basketball reference page. It should just be blanked out because that was the worst possible year. I can count on a single hand the positive things that came out of that season. And the most positive thing is the dude that was in charge is no longer there. That's crazy. It's hard to look at the progression of young, your young, young players when the coach is opting for a young promising guard to come off a bench for a scrub. It's hard to see how good our potential first overall pick is when he's playing with four non-shooters all the time. And it's hard to see of the people that aren't the top picks who's here to stay when you're not putting anybody in a position to be successful. And I feel like that is exactly what was happening for the 2023-2024 season in Detroit. Look at this, man. Look at this, bro. Look at this. Look, look at this, man. <laughs> look at it. The 67th best player in basketball for next season. K Cunningham. Now, the way ESPN does this is they're not saying that this is who he is now. They're saying this is what he's going to play like next season. They think that K Cunningham next year is going to be worse than Draymond Green, Malik Monk, Emmanuel Quickly, Chris Middleton, Gatavius, Caldwell Pope, Josh Hart. That's how bad it's been. And, and listen, I disagree wholeheartedly. I disagree wholeheartedly. But, like, I made the tweet. Those ESPN rankings always are questionable. But Cade at 67 might be the worst individual rating they've ever done. And uh, 10,000 people agree with that. Shout out to them. But there were also maybe 100 to 200 quotes. So he's just like, well, he ain't done anything. Well, he was just on the most losing team in streak history. Whatever, you, whatever, whatever. And, and again, I believe in Cade Cunningham. But I'm, I don't think it's too crazy for the people on the outside to not because of that. Because they were in a position to lose 27, 28 straight games. Or I don't remember what the number was. Because they won 14 total games on the year. So, so it's, it's just, I don't know. Also, I would take this tweet back because I, I legitimately do believe that Herb Jones at 97 is, is made. That's so bad, bro. This is not supposed to be a video about the ESPN Top 100. Last year, they didn't have Derek White on the list at all. This year, I think the, the biggest thing is having Herb Jones at 97. You cannot convince me there are 97 players in basketball that are better than Herb Jones. I'm sorry. You cannot convince me there are 97 players in basketball better than Herb Jones, but that's not what this video is about. Either way, um, K, K Cunningham. Let's stick to K Cunningham for a second. I think... K. Cunningham has a legitimate argument that in the last decade, he, compared to every other first overall pick, was put in the worst position. Now, you can argue um, you can argue Markel Fultz, I guess. I don't want to have too much revisionist history. I guess you can argue um, when Wiggins ended up in Minnesota because they were a dumpster fire then. But now, when they got Anthony Edwards, they're pretty good, um, pretty well ran. But like Victor Webiyama, he went to a bad team, but at least they're well ran. Um, the Orlando Magic were a bad team, but hell, they're a competent organization and they got good people up top making decisions and now they're a playoff team. Anthony Edwards, again, Minnesota is nice nowadays. The Pelicans, they didn't have an owner when Zion was there, but now they ran pretty well. The Suns eventually got it together and when Sarver was gone and everything and boom, I guess they got it together a little bit before Sarver was gone. Regardless, you could argue that Kay Cunningham has been in the worst position of every first overall pick for the last decade and maybe even further, but I'm not about to sit here and do that. Uh, for this video. So yeah, it is hard to figure out exactly who Kay Cunningham is um, when you put all things into it together, but this is going to be the year to find out. Now, they already gave that brother the extension, so it don't really matter at the end of the day, but I don't know. I was about to say I feel more confident in J.B. Bickerstaff as a coach, even though he's incorporating some random 
um, rules in the locker room and everything. But I also felt good about Monty Williams. And Monty Williams put off maybe the biggest finesse job in the history of basketball when he took that job to be <laughs> the coach of the Detroit Pistons. He told the world, I am not coaching next season. Ain't nothing you can do to get me the coach. They say, how, how about this minute? How much money they pay that man? Hold on. <laughs> Bro, he said, I don't want to coach. They say, here's 80 M's. He said, I'll be there, but not for long. And he did everything in his power to get fired by um, starting Killian Hayes over Jaden Ivey for whatever reason when Killian Hayes was so bad that he got waived. He literally got waived uh, like three months, four months into the season. He did things that no other NBA coach is doing. He ran many, many minutes. Oh my God, look at my hand motions. I'm, and look at my way I'm talking. Whoa, I'm tripping. Um, he played many minutes a full bench lineups with a team that legitimately had five NBA players on it. You're running whole bench lineups of dudes that aren't even in the league this year. We're talking about last season. They don't, they don't even have an NBA job anymore. Monty Williams is running full, uh, again, a completely, completely lost season. But now it's like, oh no, I mean, look at this. Okay, projected lineup is K, J9. We're gonna talk about J9 in a second. Asar Thompson, again, well, soon he's still recovering from his blood clots. He have not played in summer league so far. Tobias Harris, I know how stinky he has been in some situations, including the closeout game. Um, but Tobias Harris is objectively a better, better player than anybody that was playing this spot for them last season. And Jalen Duran, also a quality NBA player. Then they brought in Malik Beasley, who's one of the best three-point shooters in the league last season. Tim Hardaway Jr., for better or for worse, is going to get up some three-point shots. He's going to make some of them. He's going to miss a lot of them. But still, he's a three-point shooter. Simon Fontecchio was like a revelation once he ended up in Detroit last year happy to see him back and then now one of the most exciting things for me is Isaiah Stewart is going to play center again why the hell was they trying to play him at the four I don't really know but now he can legitimately play center they got in Ron Holland with the what, fifth overall pick this season like this is I can't say it's a good basketball team but I think it's a better basketball team than the 14 and whatever team from last year and it also is going to give an opportunity for Kay Cunningham to be the best version of himself I don't understand investing the first round pick in a talent and not putting the players around him that fit his his um his capabilities I wonder if these stats have been reset um there's a stat that I used to follow called um let me see if I can find I don't remember what it was called but basically it showed you with the lineups that you play with, that the people on the court, were the people on the court positive three-point shooters? It looked like they reset it, unfortunately. Dang, dude. Um, but what I can tell you is that, I mean, all it took was taking or uh, watching. Oh my God, it's here. Oh my God, it's here. Hold on. I found it. I found it. Boom, I found it. I can't believe I found it. Shout out to the people over at Thinking Basketball. This is called Mate Space and an estimate of teammates outside shooting quality. Kate Cunningham was in a ninth percentile. That's crazy. He was in a ninth percentile when it comes to his teammates spacing oh boy that's that's infuriating I'd be pissed if I was him and his his representation because Kate is a high usage pick and roll ball handler gets in my spots in the mid range and so on and so forth the pick and roll does not work if if you don't have people that keep the other the defense honest on the wings and from three that is not rocket science, that's just basketball. So Cade had to opt to take some of the most difficult shots in all of basketball last season. And he he did that and had varying levels of success. And to think Cade got to the basket as often as he did with the teams not guarding, I don't know, I don't know. I, again, I'm a firm believer in Cade Cunningham and I think this is a season where some people that have been sleeping will wake up. But I wanna talk about Jaden Ivey. Um, as we mentioned, last year was a really interesting one for him where he was starting some games, not starting other games, so on and so forth. Uh, Jay Nivey is in like the top one percentile when it comes to uh, speed and athleticism in the association. And a lot of times when you have these younger players come in with this much talent when it comes to just the wheels, they struggle with knowing when to turn it on and when to turn it off. And one guy that was so very good at this and learned it very fast was Tyrese Maxey. And that's how we get to the point where Tyrese Maxey's averaging 25.9 points per game is because he knows when I should be the fastest dude on the court and when I should slow it down because it's impossible to know when I'm going to give that burst of speed in order to get to the basket or do this or do that. I thought that Jaden Ivey over the last couple seasons really had one gear and that gear was I'm fast, I'm fast, I'm fast. Now in the preseason so far, and it's preseason, so maybe take it with a grain of salt, I feel as though he is doing better at controlling his, his tempo and his speed and that's allowing him to be more successful in the preseason he's shooting like 50% from three like objectively that's not gonna stand up you, you don't really think about percentages when uh when it comes to these type of things but 
throughout the course of his career. He's got a couple years where him as a catch and shoot player was pretty damn good last year. I think it was 32%, so maybe not as good as previous years. But like I am buying into K, uh, I'm sorry, Jaden Ivey being able to continue to progress as an NBA player because we talk about spacing. He obviously also benefits from having other people on the court that can shoot as a guy that likes to get to the rim. But I also struggle with figuring out like, what is the actual core of this team? While they do have a ton of young players between Cade, Jay Nivey, Asar Thompson, Jalen Duran, Marcus Sasser, uh, Ron Holland, obviously, Isaiah Stewart, I'm struggling to figure out who are the guys that they're really trying to build around. And that puts us back to our original question of what exactly is considered a successful season. Like in your mind, you would just hope that Kay Cunningham blossoms, Jay Nivey blossoms, Jalen Duran blossoms, everybody that you drafted over the last four seasons, you would hope that they all blossom, but that's not a realistic expectations. So this front office will probably have to use this season or half of the season to figure out, okay, our core is Kay Cunningham plus this. It's K Cunningham plus this and that. But I don't think it's going to be all of the young players that are here right now because it's just unrealistic to expect everybody to be that much better. And I'll leave you with um, some point of optimism, Detroit Pistons fans. In the 837 minutes that Kay Cunningham, Jay Nivey, and Jalen Duran played together last season, they only had a negative net rating of 1.7. I tried very hard to finagle all of this to figure <laughs> to try to get somebody with a positive net rating. Guys, hard to have a positive net rating when you lose 27, 28 games in a row. It's hard to have a positive net rating when you uh, win 14 total games. So the fact that they are only a minus 1.76 and now they're adding Tobias Harris's talent? Who 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 knows man? Ugh.